Good evening and welcome. My name is Melinda Lang and I'm a senior curatorial assistant at the Whitney Museum. I'm speaking to you today from Edward Hopper's New York, the show behind me, and as a member of the curatorial team of this exhibition, I am thrilled to introduce tonight's program, Hopper on Paper. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the Whitney Museum, which is located in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral lands of the Lenape. The city that is known today as New York inspired many of Hopper's works and his life and work there is the subject of our program tonight. The name Manhattan comes from their word Manhattan, meaning island of many hills. Our current site is close to land that was a Lenape fishing and planting site called Sapaconican, or tobacco field. We acknowledge the displacement of this region's original inhabitants and the Lenape diaspora that exists today. As a museum of American art in a city with vital and diverse communities of indigenous people, we recognize the historical exclusion of indigenous artists from the Whitney's collection and program. We are committed to addressing these erasures and honoring the perspectives of indigenous artists and communities as we work for a more equitable future. I encourage everyone to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous lands from where you're tuning in. Tonight's program is part of a two session course organized on the occasion of Edward Hopper's New York, and it offers a behind the scenes look at works on paper from the Whitney's extensive holdings by the artist. Each session will dive into Hopper's stylistic, formal and compositional decisions, as well as the historical context in which the works were created. Edward Hopper's New York charts the artist's enduring fascination with the city through more than 200 paintings, prints, drawings, and watercolors from the Whitney's collection, as well as public and private collections and archival materials. In preparation for the exhibition, we spent significant time studying the artist's drawings and prints in the Sandra Gilman Study Center, a research, storage, and display facility devoted to the museum's collection of works on paper, which includes over 19,000 prints, drawings, and photographs. The Hopper on Paper sessions offer an in-depth discussion of the artist's drawings and prints in the study center. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Kim Conaty and Clara Rojas Sebesta, who will lead this session. Kim Conaty is the Whitney's Stephen and Anne Ames Curator of Drawings and Prints. Clara Rojas Sebesta is the Whitney's Ellsworth Kelly Conservator of Works on Paper. The session will last for about 40 minutes, and I'll come back with Kim and Clara for the Q&A portion of the program. Please feel free to submit your questions during the talk, and I will select a handful of them for our speakers to answer at the end. If you would like to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, my name is Kim Conaty. I'm the Stephen and Ann Ames Curator of Drawings and Prints at the Whitney Museum. I'm Clara Rojas Sebesta. I'm the Ellsworth Kelly Conservator of Works on Paper. And we're really thrilled to welcome you here today to the Sandra Gilman Study Center. Um, this is the Works on Paper Study Center at the Whitney, where we not only have the opportunity to study amazing works on paper in our collection, but it's also a place where we store works on paper for our collection. Um, the Whitney's total collection is just over 26,000 objects. Of that, works on paper, by which I mean drawings, prints, and photographs, make up approximately 18,000. Um, right here in the study center, we have about 14,000 of those. So a great number of works from the Whitney Collection right in this room. Um, another very exciting aspect of the study center is that we are directly adjacent to our conservation studios, which is where Clara um, has the opportunity to work. So in addition to uh, our conservation work, treating, preserving, and caring for the collection, the adjacency provides a wonderful opportunity to work with our curatorial staff and do a really in-depth technical study in understanding artist materials and working process and really in a collaborative intellectual endeavor, which is really an extraordinary part of our work here. Definitely. Um, today we're going to be talking about Edward Hopper. Um, we are currently in the process of preparing for a large Hopper exhibition um, that will open this fall called Edward Hopper's New York. Um, that exhibition will, will really focus on Hopper's relationship with New York throughout the nearly six decades that he lived here, quite close to the museum in fact. 
Um, and today we wanted to take the opportunity to really do some close looking at drawings and prints of hoppers from the Whitney's collection. Um, before we jump into those works, um, I wanted to mention something that's quite interesting about the Whitney's collection, which is that we have the largest holdings of Hopper's work in the world. Um, in fact, we have just over 3,000 works by Hopper, um, and of those, nearly, you know, about 2,900 of those are drawings. Um, we have about 80 prints in the collection, and we also have um, nearly 60 of his printing plates. So we'll be looking at all of these um, ult ultimately tremendous, amazing works, but also tremendous resources for study today. Um, and so we've selected a group of prints that we'll start with and we'll be able to talk through Hopper's process. I think probably many of you know Hopper for his paintings, but in fact, he really got his start um, in prints, in illustrations first, and then really in a printmaking career where he gained his first notoriety as an artist. Printmaking is a practice that Hopper really um, learned very much on his own with some pointers from other artists. Um, Martin Lewis is one artist that I think many people have spoken about, and also his study of prints by other artists, Rembrandt, etc., that he studied in study rooms, in fact, even at the Metropolitan Museum and other places. When he was in art school, um, predominantly at the New York School of Art um, in the very early 1900s, he studied drawing, illustration, but never printmaking specifically. So one thing that was very interesting um, to us as we were trying to look through Hopper's printmaking was to get a sense of sort of what those early moments look like, um, where we can start to see how he's learning, in fact, how to use the medium. Um, and this is a great example, this print, um, The Open Window, dated from between 1918 and 1919. Hopper only begins to make prints on his own in 1915, and it's a fairly short-lived period where he's making prints, but he's doing it um, quite extensively during that period. So this, imagine this is something he's doing about a few years after he's begun to make prints and has just sort of started, and here he's really moving into a motif, um, the woman by the open window, that's a motif that really carries throughout um, his career, through his paintings as well. Um, and I'm going to turn it to Clara to talk a little bit about this print. So in terms of his drawing style, it's, it's clear when you're looking at this print that he's drawing directly on a, on a plate without a preparatory drawing. And I say that because there's something about um, the sort of the, the thickness of these lines and sort of the way he's hatching. We know from looking at his earlier drawings, he was a master of modeling shapes and forms with light and really a master of, of line. He's still trying to figure out what it looks like when you have a piece of metal, a metal plate that has a black ground on it and you're scratching in it with a burin, what that is going to end up looking like in a print. Um, so he's still getting a sense of how heavy, how deep, how thick a line will result in, in the play of light and dark that he's so well known for and is such a master of. Um, so you can see in raking light, and I'm going to use, this is a tool that conservators use quite often to really get a better understanding of these surfaces, how deeply etched. So uh, those open lines that he scratched into the plate would then be immersed in an acid bath where the acid is eating away at that print, that, that metal plate and revealing a channel into which he can then um, apply the ink. And you'll see later as he's exploring this theme, um, we have evening wind, where we also have this idea of the of the the uh, curtain blowing in the wind, that movement, that light and shade. He seems to have a better grasp as he's moving into this series of how to do that, um, create that play of light. We know that in some of Hopper's earlier prints, like um, Open Window, 1918, 1919, that he was, as Clara is saying. Um, etching directly onto the plate without a preparatory drawing. In the years that followed, it seems, based on the drawings that exist, that he did often draw his composition first before etching the plate. Um, and here we have that example, as Clara is mentioning, um, with open window. And we, can, we have the opportunity when we have drawing, plate, and final impression to really see the decision making along the way. In this case, um, probably the most clear example of that is in 
what looks like a framed artwork on the wall. We see that he's done that quite clearly here in the drawing. In the plate, it still is part of the composition. And then we see that in the final impression, um, although that the, the lines for that framed artwork are in the plate and thus would have been printed, that he's really obscured that um, by um, additional inking. Um, so we really have this kind of dark panel on the wall without actually having that detail. So we're almost by looking backwards in the process, we're able to see the details he starts with. And I think there is, um, I think very early on in Hopper's printmaking, um, he had uh, different critics and different artists who were writing about his prints. One was his close friend Guy Pendebois, an artist himself, who wrote um, about Hopper's prints that his liberties are omissions. And I think that's kind of a key idea to keep in mind as we think about this decision making throughout, that often in the final print, what he's in fact doing is taking away detail. And that's, of course, analogous to the painting process as well. Um, so we will jump from there to um, another case where we have um, a wonderful sort of story of how one of Hopper's um, very well-known prints came together, and that is East Side Interior here from, um, from 1922. So we really had the opportunity to see that decision-making process at, re at several different stages. You, uh, an artist has an opportunity to do that in different places. So in this study, we see him sort of thinking about all the different uh, places where he wants to include information. You also see lovely uh, pentimenti where he's making decisions, he's changing his mind, he's deciding uh, the, the placement of the composition directly working here, playing with that light and dark. Again, we have this, the framed, uh, uh, shape here in the, in the in the background, which here appears more as a mirror. Uh, you have a, a, a shape here which seems to be more of a reflection here. So these little details um, that are present in the drawing, we have the opportunity at this moment to see what makes it to the plate. And it's not a direct transfer. Uh, um, intaglio printmakers historically have been able to take their preparatory drawings and transfer them in various ways to that plate. They could have either uh, used this drawing and traced directly or uh, reversed it because that's another process that the artist has to go through, which is really uh, remarkable that we see Hopper doing here. He has taken this black and white drawing, reversed it because in order to get the final print to have the same orientation as his preparatory drawing, he has to create the mirror image of that on the plate. And also remember that the um, printing plate was covered with a black ground, so he's also reversing light and dark. And he's doing that all with this uh, imagination, his memory. And these are all qualities that we see in Hopper's work throughout his life, how he uses drawing, memory, imagination for those uh, final compositions in his paintings. And it begins here in his printmaking. Um, so again, we see that depth of etching and, and lines here. He's choosing where uh, here, uh, particularly these really dark areas of the chair of the room behind and the curtain, uh, that's something that he's really working on, reworking that line. So in the drawing, that's a heavy charcoal. That's another interesting choice that he's making. We'll talk a little bit more about his drawing materials. So it's a charcoal, a very draw, uh, dark line, which he has to recreate in an etching plate with deeply bitten uh, lines in that plate. And then we, it, it's interesting, as Clara was shining the, the raking light, it's always amazing to see what things you pick up on. And um, one other thing to, to mention um, is that, of course, you'll see these areas, such as the window here, where there seem to be no etched lines, where he's made no marks. And of course, to Clara's point, when thinking about these reversals, making no marks is going to translate to no inked lines. So he's really rendering a void the window, the space of the window, as a sort of an unmarked area, as, as a void itself. And there are these really fine, fine lines here in places that you'll see in the next impression, these, this is a, a fourth state, a not final state of this print. So uh, we get an, a glimpse again back in time in these states where he's printed and decided that this was way 
probably too much white, too much of a void. So he goes back to the plate and very finely etches some, uh, scratches in some, some very fine uh, cross hatching. It's also important to note in terms of intaglio printmaking processes, there were other uh, processes by which he could have achieved dark tones and light aqua tint, and these, uh, these were available to him, but he chose to really focus on the line, that kind of control, whereas aqua tint, which is a, a method where you would create tone with little fine pattern of rosin that's attached to the plate. Um, uh, but he, he keeps, uh, maintains that drawing, that cross-hatching line. Uh, and again, the transformation here is from mirror to framed our work of art here, and that's another sort of decision making. Another interesting area, Kim, I think that we weren't really sure what was going on, is this outside the window, and we see the, the facade of the building, the brick, there's this mysterious rectangle here, and in the drawing, it is a, a solid shape, it's, we're really not sure what its function is. It becomes translated in the print to this diagonally um, separated uh, shape of dark and light. It's very mysterious, still mm -hmm. not quite sure mm -hmm. if it's a sign because she's a seamstress. Mm -hmm. So it could be a sign for her business or uh, we're not really sure. Right, exactly. I think there's something neat too. You can see that from the drawing to the, the plate and the final print um, that we can tell this is on the ground floor. So some these little details that are brought into the composition um, you see this that top of a banister and a stairway. So you immediately know this is a seamstress and this is a first floor kind of parlor level window. Um, we see that the windows open. It's probably a hot summer day. Um, and then it makes this sort of mysterious element here seem, is this perhaps signage? Um, is, it, um, is, it for, is it for a shop? Is it something else? Is it um, a mirror. In any case, this, this is this wonderful kind of mystery element here. Um, and I wanted to mention also with, you know, Clara had mentioned um, that this is, um, you know, a, a kind of a midway state in the, in the final printmaking process. Hopper, like many artists, um, Hopper often worked in multiple states, meaning as Clara noted, that he would etch the plate he would then make a print, make an impression, and determine whether it was quite getting um, the qualities that he wanted, and then could always go back to the plate and etch additional lines, um, ink differently. It ends up being this wonderful kind of trial process. Um, Hopper often worked up to, to about eight um, mm. states in, in each of his prints. Um, sometimes not, but that was about the kind of the, the upper limit for him. And that's something that I think we also imagine as being really interestingly analogous to his painting process, which is a process that often took place um, over considerable time. That was a process that was both additive and reductive, involved scraping, adding, um, wiping down with a stiff brush, as you were talking about mm -hmm. before. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of these processes, a lot of these practices seem to be ones that he really honed in the in his engagement with the process of printmaking. I just wanted to add one more. Yes, do. Yeah. One more note about this. We did talk about adding details. Another opportunity for printmakers is actually to scrape down the plate. There are tools mm -hmm. in which these lines could have been erased. So there's, there's definitely that back and forth. But we will see in a moment that this, there's the scraping opportunity. And then we'll be looking at some different inkings where, at, where an artist, Hopper, can choose where to, once this plate is inked overall, then you can remove that ink. And that's a very painterly um, process. And we'll take a look at some impressions now. In these three impressions, we can start to really think about the choices that uh, Edward Hopper has been making. And this is, as we said, the fourth state before he adds in some fine hatching here. So you can really see very clearly here the difference between these uh, bright white voids, that play of light and dark. And also uh, the, the impact that the choice of paper and inking makes here. He was well known for wanting a very, very heavy dark black against a very bright white paper. It's, something, it's a preference that he expressed. So by using, by experimenting uh, with this print of a warm white paper, 
it gives a warm glow and you lose that contrast, that drama that he was after in terms of light and dark. Uh, you can also see in this, this final print ha the, uh, the impact that heavy inking. So he's focusing on that light coming through the window. We lose the, the left side of her face is in shadow. The loss of, inf not loss of information, but the de-emphasizing of that chandelier and the periphery, it's focused quite like a bright light on her face. Um, so it's really interesting those choices that he's making. You're losing information about the chair in the foreground, the piece of furniture here that's holding a, a lamp uh, that's a dark lamp, the doorway which had a curtain, some details of the folds are apparent here in the final impression that he chose just falls into darkness and we lose a sense of what that other room is there. So it, it lends a sense of mystery to this room as well. Um, I think in looking at just this one example and seeing the different choices that Hopper is making in the refining of this one impression, we also are able to glean something much bigger and broader about where he is in his practice. I mean, this is 1922. He's very close to having a sort of major moment where his painting is going to really um, explode, um, where his, he's going to become well known for watercolors at the same time. Um, he has refined something critical, which is this question of light. Um, and so here, where you see that he's working through all the different elements in the composition, the details, etc., learning how to eliminate um, or de-emphasize the less important elements until you get to the final where really the kind of the key character here is light and this idea of the kind of the light and shadow becomes the, the dramatic element, the key element in the work overall. Um, so we will shift now to looking at a couple of other examples of prints where we see this question of light and shadow and how Hopper has really played that out as, as kind of, again, the key dramatic um, element in the works. So we're now going to shift to look at two prints, each of which with two different impressions, um, really focusing on this idea of light and shadow. And of course, the most um, evocative way for, that Hopper was able to capture this at, the, at this moment was through night scenes. Um, in 1921, so this is just one year before he makes East Side Interior, the print that we just looked at, he made these two prints, one of which is Night in the Park and the other is Night Shadows, um, likely his most famous print, in fact. Um, and both of these examples, I think, are great ways of really showing how he's, dr he's really dramatized this question of light and shadow. And it's so much less about the subject and much more about this evocation of an atmosphere. So in Night in the Park, we have a scene of a solitary figure reading a newspaper beneath a light. By the post to his right, we think we know it's a street lamp, but by the way he's been able to play with the inking of the plate, it can almost be a full moon that's illuminating this figure. And you can see it much more effectively in the second impression. In this first impression, he has inked the plate uniformly, and we call that a plate tone. So the light, the highlight in the trees, the newspaper, the pathway are all evenly lighting. It's, it's a very soft, um, more moody, uh, feeling to it, but it doesn't give you that dramatic light and dark. Another choice he's going to make that I want to talk about in a minute is that the benches that the, the figure is sitting on are part of a large sequence that extends off the composition. Uh, and it's, it's very apparent here. You can see just the hint of it there. In the second choice, and to add sort of a dramatic uh, emphasis, he's wiping clean that street light, highlighting the pole there a little bit of the newspaper, so it looks like he's illuminated directly on that newspaper, and just bits and pieces of the closest parts of the, of the benches and the pathway that lead us around through the composition. That leads us in, but he's also chosen to ink this lower right corner where the benches are very darkly. It's not really apparent that there are benches there, 
we don't know, it's unclear what that shape or form is. We're sort of blocked from entering there. It kind of gives us something to hide behind as we're observing this figure. So you can see very clearly the, dra the drama and those choices that he can make by inking a plate in certain ways. The leaves in the trees where you can see the, the street light or moonlight filtering through those leaves. You can see really how much, how painterly his approach to this plate has been in these two impressions. Something else that Hopper has explained about his prints is that for the most part, the prints that he was making, the subjects that he was, that he was um, depicting are ones that he invented. Um, later in his paintings, he will often be um, sketching from, from the, the fact, as he called it, sketching from the world around him and then infusing those sketches with his imagination to create his final compositions. But for the most part, the prints really were scenes that he was not working with a model. He was really um, designing these from, um, from, from his imagination, from his invention. What's interesting to me about this particular print, Night in the Park, is if you think about where Hopper was living at the time, um, from 1913 through the end of his life in 1967, he lived um, right on Washington Square North, overlooking Washington Square Park. Um, it's possible that this print was based on um, scenes that he would have seen, in fact, um, walking through the park right in front of his townhouse, um, or at his fourth floor walk up um, at 3 Washington Square North on, on a nightly basis. Um, and so this is where we find a, sort of also a common thread throughout Hopper's work of almost that the final compositions can be a, a, like a condensation of memories that he's, that he's collected over time. Um, the other thing that's, that's wonderful here as well is um, the sense of the trees. So he, um, Hopper in many of his works and certainly in the paintings as well, had a way of depicting trees and foliage as a solid mass, um, as something that almost felt impenetrable. Um, one writer called it, you know, never the woods, always the wood. Um, and I think we see that already mm. happening in these early prints where it becomes this kind of impenetrable backdrop. And as Clara mentioned, we become almost um, an, an, an incidental voyeur on this scene of someone having a private moment in the park. Speaking of this idea of um, incidental um, voyeurism, um, this particular print, Night Shadows, is another great example of this. It's likely a view, as you see, it's a very dramatic um, um, view from above um, down to um, a sidewalk wrapping around the corner of a building. Hopper loved diagonals and loved corners, mm -hmm. as we you just saw in the last print as well. Um, and we're seeing a figure walking alone also at night with a you know, street light illuminating the scene. At the time, New York was in fact filled with elevated trains. They were, there were four lines of elevated trains. They ran throughout the city on, um, on major avenues like 3rd Avenue, 9th Avenue. And um, one scholar has written about these works as being likely views from an elevated train. So not necessarily from someone's window looking down, but actually this very common way of passing through the city where you would have seen people walking um, below you in this way. Um, and then um, there's some also great elements of the actual printmaking process at play here as well. Yes, definitely. So similarly to the, the, the painterly inking and wiping of the plate, we have that same contrast. We have a uniform plate tone here where he's maybe thinking about the composition, how those lines are playing out, the density of the, of the lines and the cross hatching. In the second impression, you can really see how he's softened these sort of hard cross hatchings, the, the way the architectural forms have been carved out on the metal plate. Here, he's picking out little bits of light animating this, this piece of architecture this, that he's viewing, interestingly, probably in, mo in motion, as, as you might be on a train. You, you get a, a sense of, of a blurring. The figure, even the shadow, which is hard cross-hatching here, is soft and fuzzy here. This, this shadow that's being cast by a street lamp and also climbing up the, the building the softness and the, the ink that's in between those lines allows that play of drama to come out and really, really animate uh, this linear 
etching. It's really quite marvelous to see and so fun to spend more time looking at carefully. And I think we have um, one last element to note, which is really true of all of the prints that we've seen um, thus far, and maybe harkens back to that kind of mystery element that we were looking at in East Side Interior that might be signage, but there's no text on it. In this case, we have the cornice of a building, and there is the idea that there is, of course, text here. There's, it's the name of something, but with Hopper, he is always pulling that specificity out, um, eliminating that. So we sort of see that also happening in this, um, in this print as well. So many of the things that we were able to see through studying Hopper's printmaking practice, we can also see through his preparatory drawings for paintings, which is what we'll look at next. And I think some of the key themes that came out in looking at printmaking process we will continue to be focusing on in the drawings. Those being questions around um, omissions, the idea of um, moving away from specificity toward greater generalization, and perhaps most compelling in the drawings is Hopper's move from working from the fact, as, as we noted earlier, the idea of working from nature, working from the world around him directly, to improvisation, which is where he would be back in his studio and really find a way of bringing together his observations from the world, distilling those also through memories and bringing them all together into compositions that are themselves composites or improvisations. And so we'll be moving over to the other wall in the study center to look at these drawings next. A great opportunity to get to see Hopper's process through drawing is through his drawings for New York movie. Um, the Whitney is really lucky to have in its collection 52 of his sketches for this one painting. The painting is a work from 1939. Um, it's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art and it is included in Edward Hopper's New York, um, along with a number of the studies for it. And the studies, in fact, for Hopper um, began in late 1938. So we see already that it was a process that um, resulted in several weeks of his study um, and both working from the facts, um, from, in his case, many his, his time in many theaters around New York, and then ultimately also working with his wife, the artist Josephine Nivison Hopper, um, as his model, and she was really his model throughout the time that they lived together. They were married in 1924, and really from that point on, she becomes his sole model for the paintings that followed. Um, so we're going to start by looking closely at the different types of these drawings for a New York movie. Um, uh, again, working at this idea of Hopper um, working from the fact, working from the actual sites that he would then later distill, adjust, and improvise in his final paintings. Edward and Josephine, his wife, um, most commonly known as just simply Joe, were really avid theater goers. Um, they loved going to the movies, they loved seeing live theater, and it's in that way not a huge surprise that, the, that a theater itself would become a subject and an inspiration for, in fact, several of Hopper's works. Um, here, again, looking at New York movie, we're looking at a composition of a movie house specifically, um, and one that in order to come up with this composition, um, he studied the interiors of four different theaters around Times Square, the Strand, the Globe, the Republic, and the Palace. And we have examples of all of those here. And looking at the materials, the drawing materials, the size format of the paper, we can kind of imagine them with their pads in hand. And they've chosen these, this small format. They can very discreetly sort of observe a reportage and of the little areas of, of the movie theater that caught his attention. Again, these very quick strokes. He's, he uses mostly black and white media through, throughout his career. Conte crayon, which is a, uh, a fabricated chalk that has a little bit of a wax, a little bit of a hardness to it, and charcoal and graphite pen, uh, pencil. Those are his most common drawing materials. Um, the Conte crayon allows him to make very quick, dark strokes um, to capture that impression. As we know, we, uh, he's very attracted to this idea of dark and light, which in a movie theater would be readily available. So he's quickly sketching curtains and hidden 
hidden views. Here's a stairways or uh, little peeks into other hidden areas of the theater, uh, balconies. Uh, so you can see that very, very quick movement. He's, he's moving through the space. I'm not really sure what this little decorative area there is. It looks, in some of these, we have, um, you know, we have him sketching a composition in one orientation, but in mm. other cases, elements will intrude on a particular page where in this case it looks as if it's it's simply it's a vertical column that he is fitting into the bottom of the sketch of this sort of um, curtained uh, stairwell. Adding notations about what he's observing mm -hmm. there. This is a lovely sketch of capsing, capturing a glimpse of the movie there, a figure perhaps, um, and the figure sitting in front of him as he's, as he's uh, moving through the space more architectural angles, again, the dynamic of moving through a diagonal through space. We see a lot of him take, taking those elements that he'll comp uh, compose later. Mm -hmm. um, so we see the, the actual theaters that he was taking these notational sketches from by the annotations that he's made on the bottom of all of these um, small sketches. And we can see then that from the Strand, the Republic, and the Globe, he generally worked only on these smaller sheets of paper. Um, it seems that when he went to the palace, also beginning with these smaller sheets of paper, he recognized that in that interior, he found what could be potentially most useful for his final composition. And he then returned to the palace with larger sheets of paper, which we'll look at in a moment. So with these larger sheets of paper, we begin to see him exploring a little bit more the detail, the atmosphere, and we also see him add charcoal into the mix along with the Conte crayon. Uh, this allows him to, charcoal is much more friable and powdery. Um, it allows him to introduce sort of that soft uh, shading. This, you can see him blurring the, the lines to capture this contrast of light and dark here in these three uh, chandeliers. He's, he can also very quickly capture the gestures of these, of these seats. Uh, and he's starting to bring together the composition, as we see in this final, uh, this third drawing here, uh, where he brings together all the elements. He's chosen his viewpoint, which is to capture the back of the audience, a, a fragment of the film, the movie that's being shown, as well as being divided into this sort of private space where we'll see inhabited in a few moments. So it's this contrast, this division of, of light and dark and public and private that's really very interesting for him to explore in this imaginary uh, space that he's creating in New York movie. In many of Hopper's theater paintings, um, in addition to New York movie, one thing that's fascinating is that he's very rarely depicting the action on stage. He is often depicting um, an empty theater or um, the, something happening around the theater, um, someone hanging over a balcony or um, uh, um, attendees of theater um, rising from their seats at an intermission. Um, we rarely get this sort of focal point on what's actually on stage in, in a way that his composition is the stage for him. Um, we will, we're now going to move to um, a couple of other sketches that, that show the kind of continuation of his process as he's moving again from these on-site from the fact sketches into um, the sort of framing out of the, of the composition. So we see Hopper back in his Washington Square studio starting to think about the proportions and scale of the final composition for New York movie. Here on the left, we see the graphite pencil outlines of that composition, how he's breaking up this sort of that private uh, curtain space. And in this rare color drawing where he's using a red Conte, so it's a clay fabricated chalk um, painting that same feel, but we have him getting a sense of what that overall red warmth that, of that final painting is going to be, that red glow of, of the rich interior of that painting. He's already starting to play with the dimensions. We have annotations of 36 by 40. The final composition is 32 by 40. And he's really thinking about the placement of, of the figure finally being introduced here. Hopper uses the, all these preparatory studies, uh, the figure studies, uh, all these details, and transfers them onto the canvas. Again, in 
and similarly the way he did with printmaking and etching, he d there's not a single uh, drawing that he transfers onto a canvas. He's again improvising and synthesizing directly onto that canvas. He's done that in Conte crayon and then he goes over those Conte crayon lines with a dilute Prussian blue uh, oil paint wash. We know this uh, because my colleague, Matt Skopek, the paintings conservator here at the Whitney, has been able to do infrared photography, which allows us to expose paintings with infrared light that penetrates that painting layer and is absorbed, um, reflected back by the canvas and absorbed by those uh, underdrawing layers. So we can really identify where he's, uh, what that initial composition was, any changes he might have made in that final painting. So again, another way to peek below the surface that conservators have access to. We really uh, use these scientific uh, methods to learn more about the composition, learn more about the, um, the process that the artists have used. We use that not only for uh, understanding, for helping art historians and scholars to learn more about artists, but also to help in our treatment and decision-making processes. Those types of studies are always really revelatory because to the naked eye, we're not able to see the way, in, in many cases, um, we're not able to see the way that an artist begins the process of building up a painting. Um, and especially such a, um, a kind of heavily rendered and, and carefully constructed painting like this. Um, but as Clara mentioned, through these more sort of scientific methods that conservators can use, we're able to understand how the work is built up. And that is something that's used, I think, for, um, for studies through, for art history, but also often for care and preservation of the work to really, it's important to understand what is there in the underlayers before any treatment is, it takes place. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why we've really uh, committed to taking care of Hopper's painting in particular, since we have such a large collection of his work here. Um, so we're now gonna move to the final stage um, of, of Hopper's kind of construction of New York movie. Um, and that is the model, the figure. Um, so also, uh, Clara mentioned that these compositional sketches were likely done back in the Washington Square studio after his careful study of the different architectural details from the theaters. But then um, he wants to then have a figure who was also drawn sort of from the fact, um, from life, be the one who's inhabiting this painting. And I mentioned earlier that Joe, his wife, was really his, his, his model throughout all of his works. So we'll look at a couple of the studies where she is modeling for not just, in fact, the figure of the usherette, but also for the, um, the theater goers as well. Hopper's figure studies for his compositions are always really fascinating. Um, because you begin to see how he is in many ways almost acting like a stage director in many of his compositions, kind of, kind of creating a scene, creating a set, and then populating it with the right characters. Um, uh, so in this case, for New York movie, we see um, his wife Jo posing, um, as noted, both for the usherette who is standing um, in the composition at the, at the right-hand side, and also for the moviegoers as well. So you see the back of her head here and here with a hat. Um, what's really neat about some of the material that we have um, also in the Whitney collection is that in, um, in some of the ledger books where mm -hmm. Joe and Edward worked together to document his works, um, in a, in, where Joe would describe um, often the, um, the scene that he's, he's making and he would make a small sketch of that scene. Um, we have notations that might say something of, um, sometimes they came up with names, like characters for the different figures in the paintings. Um, and this was largely coming from Joe. Joe herself was actually an amateur actress. She was an, she was an artist as well, but she really got her, um, her start um, with the Washington Square Players, sort of an amateur troupe um, in downtown New York. So there is, so her con collaboration with Hopper in many of these compositions is something that is in, in many ways in keeping with some of her training. Um, she enjoyed this process of um, often searching for the right props or um, dressing the part, um, determining what type of hat or coat she should be wearing for the different figures. Um, in this case, we have her 
um, dressed in a very typical um, usherette uniform that would have been worn at the time. And we also see where Hopper is very carefully um, trying out different, very specific elements of the pose. So you have both the overall, but you also have him trying out how exactly the arms would cross, how exactly the flashlight would peer out. And we also have in this case some indications where he's thinking about color. Um, he does this often in his sketches too, where we have noted here dark green. So he's beginning to think about color through the sketches. Um, and the blue, these sort of daubs of blue paint here that feel um, accidental, in fact, this is the same blue paint that he will then use for the uniform um, of in the final painting. In this case, um, where he has, where he's depicting Joe as his model for the theater goers, um, one thing that I've always been struck by is that he also made a number of drawings of Joe um, sitting in a chair in their apartment reading. And in many ways, this is very similar to that pose, but here, um, this particular chair, this particular, you know, the book becomes potentially a playbill in her lap. Um, and we have this idea of trying on different um, costumes in order to play the part of the, of the different moviegoers. Um, in these figure studies where we see Joe posing for um, the, the figures in the final composition, we can also see um, certain changes that were made between the sketches and the final painting. So for example, we know that, um, that Edward had Joe pose for the seated figure with multiple hats, sometimes without hats, in different guises. And then in the end, the composition includes one figure with the hat, similar to the one above here, and then um, a male figure, a sort of bald-headed male figure, um, seated just to the left of that figure. This may have been um, based on a self-portrait of Hopper himself. Um, we know that he did pose sometimes for the male figure in his paintings by using a mirror in the studio. Um, this is probably most be uh, best known in the painting Nighthawks. Um, it may have been the case here too. Um, in w another thing that's kind of wonderful to think about in the, the posing, when we think about the actual people who are um, kind of costuming themselves and preparing for a painting like this, um, some notes that Joe had written about this particular pose. So we know that he began making the sketches um, in the New York theaters beginning in December, 1938. He'll finish the final painting in early 1939. And we know that these sketches were done in the middle of January in 1939, before the final painting, of course. And if one thinks about January in a very old building, um, quite chilly. Um, so Joe talks about posing for this figure in their you know, freezing cold hallway of the building. Um, and the, these types of kind of these real life aspects of the, the making of these paintings that come into play. Um, through looking at all of these sketches though, the sketches on site in the theaters, the tiny details that might crop up in some small part of the painting, the color study, um, and of course the figure studies, we see really how Hopper over several weeks found ways of really building these compositions. Um, they become improvisation, they become composites, um, and there is a way that he sort of described his intentions in, in painting um, just after making this painting, a bit, a bit later in his career, when he described his interest in creating, quote, a realistic art from which fantasy can grow. So the idea of creating a real space that's based on real spaces, but then allowing a sort of story or allowing um, the, the kind of the fantasy, the imagination to creep in. Hello, thank you all for joining us tonight for the Q&A portion of the program. I'm here with Kim and Clara, and we'll now get to some of your questions. And I'll jump in right away. Um, to start, I think we have some great questions from the audience about Hop Hopper's subject matter, his imagery. 
So one, one audience member asked, did Hopper ever talk about the subjects he chose for his prints? Um, well, I can uh, toss a few things out here. Um, unfortunately, not so much. We have much more information about subjects from his paintings, mm -hmm. probably because um, later art historians and curators asked him about it a lot. Um, we have some information about um, his print East Side Interior that he did mention, and this was you know, related to the types of scenes that he might have mm -hmm. seen um, walking around the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, but in general, uh, what we mostly know is that these were scenes that he, I think as we mentioned the program, mm -hmm. would have um, really um, created on his own, but of course based on his experiences mm -hmm. in the city. Inspi inspired by his surroundings. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we have another question that's more about process. So um, an audience member asks, why do some of the prints have cross hatching? What is the purpose of that? And, and also, did Hopper ever use dry point technique? And would he have ever combined aquatent with dry point? Clara, do you want to speak to this? Sure, I'm happy to. So those are all uh, cross hatching, aquatint, soft ground. These are all methods within Italian printmaking where you can create those tones, those rich blacks, rather than just lines. So if you're not going to use an aqua tint, which is an overall tone with gloss, and I think I mentioned it, mm -hmm. or a soft ground, he used traditional hard ground, where you would create the, the lines, as I mentioned. And in order to create shading, or darker areas of modulating black, you'd have to put the, the lines closer together. The closer together the lines are, the more ink they can mm -hmm. hold, and that's how he was able to create those tones. That's how he used cross hatching literally a cross right. pattern in right. the plate. Right, thank you, Clara. Did you want to say anything about dry point? Oh, yeah. So dry point is a way where you're not uh, scratching through the ground. You're just scratching directly mm -hmm. into the plate. And it's a, very, it's a beautiful um, line. It's very, uh, you can really uh, get very fine drawn lines, but it's also super fragile. So mm -hmm. it does, as it's run through the press to get very, various proofs or impressions, that fine line gets uh, smoothed down and no longer holds ink. So that's why um, dry point has a, a very specific use and he didn't use it very often. It's interesting thinking about if perhaps he, you know, obviously he had kind of like mastered the, the etching technique and he was mm -hmm. able to get the effects he wanted from that. But mm -hmm. knowing that he was often kind of um, printing on demand, um, mm -hmm. he maybe wanted to be able to keep a, a plate sturdy enough to continue to make impressions from it. Right. This is all conjecture, but <laughs> just an idea. No, that's a, a frequently, a frequent approach to the printmaking. Practical, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're getting some questions about um, Hopper's influences. So um, was Hopper interested in other artists working in Intaglio? Uh, who did he look to specifically? Um, another great question, and one that we have only a, a bit of information about specifically. Uh, we know that it, well, Hopper had a close uh, friendship um, for many years with the um, print curator and also um, de print dealer, Carl Zagrosser. And in conversations with Zagrosser, he did share his interest in um, the, the French artist, uh, Charles Marion, for example, and that he had studied his work um, in the Met study rooms, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, it seems like one thing that he would have taken from Marion, for example, was um, maybe the way that Marion was kind of looking at the city of Paris mm. and, and really looking at um, built environment and spaces. And then again, um, this very kind of dramatic play with light and shadow mm. um, in scenes that have omitted a lot of the kind of excess detail. Mm, those kinds of contrasts. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, we're getting some questions more related to Okay, that, well, yeah, the states of his print. So um, an audience member asked him, was it, was it usual for an artist like Hopper, of course, certainly kept um, different states of his prints? And I know we talked about this in the program. Clara, um, do you want to say anything more about um, his choice to hold on to different states of a print? So a printmaker would keep the different states of a print to get a sense of that process, that painterly process that we just spoke about, different um, uh, different inking methods, uh, different lines where he might need to change or, or uh, moderate his, um, modulate his, his composition. So it would be a, a great learning process as he's mastering mm -hmm. um, etching. And we can see that progress throughout um, the prints that we have here in the collection, this mm -hmm. interesting process. Um, but I don't think that he um, would have displayed them or distributed them 
in that way in terms of how did he use his print as a right like likely not um i mean he was showing his prints in exhibitions often mm -hmm. in group exhibitions really starting around 1918 um but most of his you know he was also i think i just mentioned that he was you know um printing on demand so if uh through one of his galleries if there was interest in a print then he was making that to be um, to be son of the final state, and that mm -hmm. that would be the, what would go out into the world. Did he addition his prints? He didn't addition his prints, um, although he, uh, at least he, he told Zagrosser when they were you know, speaking about this, that he never wanted to go upwards of 100. Um, that said, it does not in any way mean that his, um, his prints were ever an addition of 100, mm -hmm. in fact, quite to the contrary. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one exception, and um, I think you mentioned there might have been another question about, um, in our conversation before we just started, mm -hmm. there was another question about whether he printed all of his own mm -hmm. prints or if he had any That's help. Right. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit mm -hmm. um, just to tap into that question, which is, or to answer that, um, he did print all of his prints himself mm -hmm. at a press in his studio. Mm -hmm. But there's one exception, and that is the print Night Shadows, uh, for which he did print his own edition or his own i shouldn't say edition he did make his own impressions of it mm -hmm. but he also gave um a plate to peter platt who mm -hmm. then printed um, a much larger edition to be um to be included with as a, as part of an edition project for the new republic so that's really mm -hmm. the one the one exception he was often also printing on demand in a way too like exactly galleries would inquire mm -hmm. about a new impression mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I want to also leave some time to talk about Hopper's studies, um, but I, there's one more question about etching. I'll get to it. Just came in, um, asking this audience member asked kind of how one of Hopper's most important moves as a printmaker was what he left out of the process, which I know you both talk about um, in the program, and what he left out of the process at the end, um, and then decided not to include what perhaps that was just as important to him in the end. Um, do you want to say anything more about that decision making of how um, what he left out was just as important as what he chose to include? Or if there's anything else you want to add? <laughs> so I think what we're referring to is that decision to obscure some of the details yes. of the lines with the inking. And absolutely, that was his, his playing with paint and mm -hmm. kind of foreshadowing what that approach would be, mm -hmm. I think. That's what I've learned through our long discussions, it's been so fascinating to learn. <laughs> Definitely, and I think it's something that, um, uh, yeah, I, I do always think about that statement that his friend and artist, fellow artist, Guy de Bois said his, that literally his, li his liberties are omissions and that that's mm -hmm. something that holds true throughout. And we see this in the sketches for a number of paintings mm -hmm. where there's so much more detail mm -hmm. in the sketches. Mm -hmm. And then in the painting, you see all of what he's actually eliminated from there. I mean, I, I always feel like the final work for Hopper is this um, very intense distillation mm -hmm. of the world around him filtered, I mean, as he would probably say, filtered through the world within him. And it comes out in this extremely distilled way that also allows, you know, specificity allows like specific places to take on these more universal, uh, a more universal feel. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting how he takes that forward throughout his career and all of his paintings. It's mm -hmm. really like they are in the early, in the early print process. Mm -hmm. um, so to get on to move forward with the studies, um, we're getting a question about Hopper's um, process with uh, making annotations on his drawings. So an audience member asked, what kind of notes did he include in his studies for paintings? Of course, I know you all talked about the annotations of the names of the theaters and the studies for New York movie, but did he make any other annotations or no notes of any kind? Um, from what we've seen in studying um, the nearly 3,000 <laughs> drawings in the <laughs> Whitney's collection, there, there were really kind of two different types of annotation. One would be the annotation that might be acknowledging a specific place, mm -hmm. like we see in the theater sketches. And we see that in some other, in some other places as well, where it's like Central Park, New York, or the, you know, this kind of like noting the place. The other type of annotation is really a notation in preparation for his painting, and that tends to be color notations. Beautiful. And we have some really amazing um, sketches that Hopper made for many of his paintings 
that have, you know, it'll be a sketch that we have in another form with just the forms or just the composition. And then there's, there's often one that then has all of these little like arrows coming off of it that says, you know, this like magenta, yellow, like the very, the specific paint that he's mm -hmm. going, they plans mm -hmm. to use for that. It's gray, white, white, gray, blue, green, just every shade, mm -hmm. all those beautiful modulations on his um, landscape main paintings, just the water and the surfaces. I think some of those are my favorite drawings with those Same. beautiful mm -hmm. descriptions of colors Definitely. that he was sort of visualizing in his imagination. So Yeah, yeah I always think about the railroad sunset yes. sketch too, yeah. which is, mm -hmm. you know, as a painting, it's not a painting in Edward Harper's New York, but um, the, the painting is really just the incredible sunset. There is a, there's the building there, the railroad station, but all of the, the feel is, is the color. Mm -hmm. And then, so the drawing is just like a couple of dashes of line and then all the color annotations. <laughs> it's incredible. Really yeah, it's exciting to see those drawings. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we're about to wrap up and I'm seeing that we, I think this is maybe a good moment to end actually. Um, is there anything else you want to add? I don't think so, right? Well, we'll <laughs> <laughs> last second in we're at right at seven o'clock um so i'll say thank you all for tuning in tonight and for your great questions and thank you kim and clara for your fascinating insights it's a, such a fantastic program and i i hope everyone will come see the exhibition edward hopper's new york which is on view through march 5th and thank you both again thank you thank you. thank you all